Lord be with you. We welcome you this evening. We gather for our first out of a three-part service. So tonight is part one, tomorrow part two, Sunday part three. This is Monday, Thursday. Monday meaning command. And so Jesus gives us a command this evening, actually a couple. Uh, one, obviously the command to do this in remembrance of me, do this sacrament and receive what I give to you. He also gives us an example. This is the night when he would wash his disciples' feet. And so he says, I've given you an example to follow. Do this. So this is the word Monday is a Latin word meaning command. So we remember what Jesus instructed us to do. A couple key parts of this service. Obviously, uh, the Lord's Supper is celebrated during Monday, Thursday. This is the night when Jesus instituted it or started it. At the end of the service is what we call the stripping of the altar. If you've been to the service before, you know what happens, but at the end, so there will be no um, nunc dimittis, no post-communion song, and the service will end with me reading Psalm 22. This is the psalm that Jesus quotes from the cross. We'll actually talk more about that tomorrow, but as I'm reading that, the uh, communion vessels, the candles, the pyramids, and so forth are all removed. And that's to symbolize that Jesus, when he was arrested, how he was treated, stripped, beaten, left bare, exposed. And we, we need to see that, and this is how we symbolize it, that our altar and our lectern and our pulpit, they will be bare. After a brief time of silence, I will leave, and you may leave when you're ready, but there is no closing hymn. We leave in silence in preparation for tomorrow, which is also an evening we'll leave in silence, but I'll explain that service tomorrow. So I think that's the key part of the service to be aware of. Aware of. That's at the very end. We turn to our opening hymn.
You may remain seated. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. During this Lenten season, we have heard our Lord's call to intensify our struggle against sin, death, and the devil, all that prevents us from trusting in God and loving each other. Since it is our intention to receive the Holy Supper of our Lord Jesus Christ on this night, which he instituted this blessed meal for our salvation, it is proper that we complete our Lenten discipline by diligently examining ourselves as St. Paul urges us to do. This holy sacrament has been instituted for the special comfort of those who are troubled because of their sin and who humbly confess their sins, fear God's wrath, and hunger and thirst for righteousness. But when we examine our hearts and consciences, we find nothing in us but sin and death, from which we are incapable of delivering ourselves. Therefore, our Lord Jesus Christ has had mercy on us. For our benefit, he came, became man, so that he might fulfill for us the whole law of God and to deliver us took upon himself our sin and the punishment we deserve. So that we may more confidently believe this and be strengthened in the faith and in holy living, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, broke it, and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. It is as if he said, I became man, and all that I do and suffer is for your good. As a pledge of this, I give you my body to eat. In the same way, he also took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Again, it is as if he said, I have had mercy on you by taking into myself all your iniquities. I give myself into death, shedding my blood to obtain grace and forgiveness of sins and to comfort and establish the New Testament, which gives forgiveness and everlasting salvation. As a pledge of this, I give you my blood to drink. Therefore, whoever eats this bread and drinks this cup, confidently believing this word and promise of Christ, dwells in Christ and Christ in him and has everlasting life. We should also do this in remembrance of him, showing his death, that he was delivered for our offenses and raised for our justification. Giving him our most heartfelt thanks, we, thank, we take up our cross and follow him, and according to his commandment, love one another as he has loved us. As our Lord on this night exemplified this love by washing his disciples' feet, so we, by our words and actions, serve one another in love. For we are all one bread and one body, even as we are all partakers of this one bread and drink from the one cup. For just as the one cup is filled with the wine of many grapes and one bread made from countless grains, so also we, being many, are one body in Christ. Because of him, we love one another, not only in word, but in deed and in truth. May the almighty and merciful God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ by his Holy Spirit, accomplish this in us. Amen. Having heard the word of God, let us confess our sins, imploring God our Father for the sake of his Son, Jesus Christ, to grant us forgiveness. O oh, Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you and justly deserved your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you of your boundless mercy and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. Upon this your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you, and in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. The Lord be with you.
Let us pray together. O oh Lord, in this wondrous sacrament, you have left us a remembrance of your passion. Grant that we may so receive the sacred mystery of your body and blood, that the fruits of your redemption may continually be manifest in us. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Old Testament reading is from Exodus chapter 24. We begin with uh, verse number 3. This is when Moses is confirming the covenant with the people of Israel, and the covenant requires the shedding of blood. We begin with verse 3. Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the rules. And all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words that the Lord has spoken we will do. And Moses wrote down all the words of the Lord. He rose early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain and 12 pillars according to the 12 tribes of Israel. And he sent young men of the people of Israel who offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen to the Lord. And Moses took half of the blood and put it in the basins and half of the blood he threw against the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people, and they said, All that the Lord has spoken we will do, and we will be obedient. And Moses took the blood and threw it on the people and said, Behold, the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. Then Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel went up, and they saw the God of Israel there was under his feet, as it were, a pavement of sapphire stone, like the very heaven for clearness. And he did not lay his hand on the chief men of the people of Israel. They beheld God and ate and drank. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second reading is from the book of Hebrews, chapter 9, beginning with verse number 11. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then though the greater and more perfect tent, or through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the sprinkling of defiled persons with the blood of goats and bulls and with the ashes of a heifer sanctifies for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Therefore, he is the mediator of a new covenant so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance. Since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. For where a will is involved, the death of the one who made it must be established. For a will takes effect only at death, since it is not in force as long as the one who made it is alive. Therefore, not even the first covenant was inaugurated without blood. For when every commandment of the law had been declared by Moses to all the people, he took the blood of calves and goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant that God commanded for you. And in the same way, he sprinkled with the blood both the tent and all the vessels used in worship. Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I invite you to stand. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 26th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. We begin with verse number 17. Now on the first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying, Where will you have us prepare for you to eat the Passover? He said, Go into the city to a certain man and say to him, The teacher says, My time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house 
with my disciples. And the disciples did as Jesus had directed them, and they prepared the Passover. When it was evening, he reclined at table with the twelve. And as they were eating, he said, Truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. And they were very sorrowful and began to say to him one after another, Is it I, Lord? He answered, He who has dipped his hand in the dish with me will betray me. The Son of Man goes as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. Judas, who would betray him, answered, Is it I, Rabbi? He said to him, You have said so. Now, as they were eating, Jesus took bread. And after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You sing our hymn? You may be seated. Grace to you from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. God speaks to us this evening in our gospel reading from Matthew 26. Here again these words. Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread. And after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, Drink of it. All of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of the fruit of this vine until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. 
This section of text is commonly referred to as the institution of the Lord's Supper. For our next few minutes together, we're going to meditate on Jesus' words and the significance of the sacrament he instituted. To guide our meditation, we're going to lean on both the small and the large catechism. So the sermon this evening is perhaps going to be more catechetical in nature. But it is so very important for us to appreciate what God is doing here in the sacrament. Let me just start with this point. The sacrament is about what God is doing. In fact, that is the centerpiece of all of worship. It's first about what God is doing. He is speaking and forgiving through his word, through his called pastor, through his sacraments. So the primary actor in worship is God. We are the receivers and the responders. God is the actor. This is why what happens in worship is so important. Why it's not merely a matter of us going to church. It's a matter of God promising to come to us through the means he has established to manifest his presence and to bring to us his promises. Okay, let's meditate on the Lord's Supper. The small catechism opens with this question, what is the sacrament of the altar? And it offers this answer. It is the true body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ under the bread and wine instituted by Christ himself for us Christians to eat and to drink. Now, obviously, the key word here is, is. The Lord's Supper is bread and wine. The Lord's Supper is the body and blood of Christ. Is this a mystery? Yes. But this is what Jesus said. These words were his last will and testament. He did not say, this bread symbolizes my body or this wine symbolizes my blood. He said, is. Many have heard his words and concluded them impossible. He couldn't mean what he said. Martin Luther heard such murmurings in his day, and he penned this response in the large catechism. With this word, you can strengthen your conscience and declare, let a hundred thousand devils with all the fanatics come forward and say, how can bread and wine be Christ's body and blood? Still, I know that all the spirits and scholars put together have less wisdom than the divine majesty has in his little finger. Here is Christ's word. Take, eat, this is my body. Drink of it, all of you. This is the New Testament in my blood. Here we shall take our stand and see who dares to instruct Christ and alter what he has spoken. It is true indeed that if you take the word away from the elements or view them apart from the word, you have nothing but ordinary bread and wine. But if the word remains as is right and necessary, then by virtue of them the elements are true body, are truly the body and blood of Christ. For as Christ's lips speak and say, so it is. He cannot lie or deceive. Jesus said, is. We do not dare instruct him or change his last will and testament. He is the God who created and ordered the cosmos, the God who parted the Red Sea, the God who made a virgin conceive and bear the world's Christ, and the God who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead. If Jesus said is, he meant is. But some will say, but Jesus also said, I am the door. He said, I am the bread of life, I am the vine. And he didn't mean that he was literally a door or a loaf of bread or a vine. True. Pay attention now. Jesus didn't say, I am a door, or I am a bread, or I am a vine. He said, I am the door, the bread, the vine. And he meant it. 
we must do a better job of hearing what Jesus says. He is the door to heaven. He is the bread of life. He is the vine who connects us to the Father. The small catechism continues with this question. What is the benefit of this eating and drinking? And offers this answer. These words given and shed for you, for the forgiveness of sins, show us that in the sacrament, forgiveness of sins, life and salvation are given us through these words. For where there is forgiveness of sins, there is also life and salvation. Please hear these words. Internalize them. See what Jesus is doing. He is connecting forgiveness to this sacrament. And as Luther points out, where there is forgiveness of sins, there is also life and salvation. See, this is what makes the church the church. This is what makes the church completely different from any other gathering or group or institution in the world. Because in the center of the church is this altar where Jesus is forgiving our sins, where Jesus is bringing us life and salvation. He's connected it all to visible elements so that we can see that we can smell, that we can touch, that we can taste, so that we can know that God is for us. But the catechism asks, well, how can bodily eating and drinking do such great things? And it answers, certainly not just eating and drinking do these things, but the words written here, given and shed for you for the forgiveness of sins, these words, along with the bodily eating and drinking, are the main thing in the sacrament. Whoever believes these words has exactly what they say, forgiveness of sins. So the active agent here is God's word. There's nothing magic in the bread or the wine. There's nothing magic in the altar. It's the word connected to the bread and the wine that makes the sacrament the sacrament and that brings God's promise to us in person. But some may ask, well, okay, but what if I don't really feel the need for the sacrament? Martin Luther offers this answer in the large catechism. For those in such a state of mind that they cannot feel it, I know no better advice than that they put their hands to their bosom to determine whether they are made of flesh and blood. If you find that you are, then for your own good, turn to St. Paul's epistle to the Galatians and hear what are the fruits of your flesh. Now, the works of the flesh are obvious. Adultery, fornication, impurity, licentiousness, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, anger, quarrels, dissensions, factions, envy, murder, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these. For this reason, if you cannot feel the need, at least believe the scriptures. They will not lie to you, since they know your flesh better than you yourself do. I want us to appreciate Luther's point. He's saying we cannot be trusted to evaluate our own desires or our own motivations or our own actions because we are morally bent. So we cannot assume our moral character is plumb. Here's what I'm saying. We all need a plumb line to determine straight. All of us. Everyone does. And we can't be that plumb line because we are bent. So to know our true nature, we must see God's plumb line. And that's what Luther is saying. You see... You will lie to yourself to protect your sin. You will lie to yourself to protect your sin. God will not lie to you. He will reveal your sin. And yes, that might be painful. That's why so many people avoid actually 
hearing God's word. But God will reveal your sin so you can confess it and be forgiven. So you can approach the altar in humble faith and leave in confident joy. Martin Luther put it, puts it this way in the large catechism. If you are burdened and feel your weakness, go joyfully to the sacrament and let yourself be refreshed, comforted, and strengthened. Friends, I know of no better way to encourage you. The sacrament is for you, for your forgiveness, for your life, for your salvation. In Jesus' name, amen. Now the peace of God that passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord to life everlasting, amen. I invite you to stand. We confess together, I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us man and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated as we gather our offering. Children, you can bring yours forward too.
We stand to pray. Lord God, we come before you in humble thanksgiving that you, knowing our need to see, touch, taste, feel, that you have brought before us into our ears the word of Christ, washed over us the forgiveness of Christ in baptism, placed into our very mouths the body and blood of Christ in the sacrament of the altar for the forgiveness of sins. You connect your word of promise to something that we can see, touch, taste, smell, so we can sense and know where you have brought your promises into our midst. Help us to receive these great gifts in faith. Help us to know that the church is the gathering of your people around these great gifts, that you are the primary actor in worship. We are the receivers and the responders. So gather your people around the means by which you have promised to be present, the means through which you promise to come to us, that we may receive these gifts of forgiveness, life, and salvation. We may receive them in faith. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we bring before you all of our sorrows, our fears, our anxieties, our griefs, even our regrets. We bring them to you in our brokenness. We pray for healing and help. Lord, we bring before you so many who grieve those who have died. Most especially now, we grieve with the Johnson family, with Trinity, Zion, with Manila, and Manning, and surrounding communities, as all of us are affected by the loss of our brother in Christ. We thank you for the goodness that you showed to him, empowering him to confess Christ, and allowing him to model for us how to finish well with the confession of Christ firmly upon his lips. Lord God, help us to live well. And when our time comes, help us also to finish well with the confession of Christ upon our lips. Bring your word of comfort and promise to all who grieve, whether for this death or for other deaths that have touched us profoundly. Bring your word of promise and hope in Christ into our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And Lord, we ask that you would gather people to your church that they would receive this great gospel message in faith and celebrate it with exuberant joy. Bless our reception of the sacrament this evening. Bless our commemoration of Christ's death tomorrow and our joyful celebration of his resurrection on Easter Sunday. We ask that you would hear our prayers for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, in whose name we pray. Amen. We continue with the service of the sacrament. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks unto the Lord our God. It is truly fitting, right, and beneficial that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who accomplished the salvation of mankind by the tree of the cross, that where death arose, their life also might rise again and that the serpent who overcame by the tree of the garden might likewise by the tree of the cross be overcome. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing together.
we pray together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. In the same way, also took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do, as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen.
Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same, in faith toward you, and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh, my God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but I find no rest. Yet, you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. And you, our fathers trusted. They trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm, not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. Yet you are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust you in my mother's breasts. On you was I cast from my birth, and from my mother's womb you have been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none to help. Many bulls encompass me. Strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. For dogs encompass me. A company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them. And for my clothing they cast lots. But you... O oh Lord, do not be far off. O oh, you, my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. You have rescued me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him, all you offspring of Jacob. Glorify him and stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel. For he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, and he has not hidden his face from him. But he has heard when he cried to him. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will perform before those who fear him. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall worship before you. For kingship belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. All the prosperous of the earth eat and worship. Before him shall bow all who go down to the dust even the one who could not keep himself alive. Posterity shall serve him. It shall be told of the Lord to the coming generation. They shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn, that he has done it.